Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to today's episode of Wisdom of the Soul, brought to you by the Ageless Wisdom Mystery School. This is our ongoing free Zoom class, also available on YouTube, and uh, an edited version is podcast as well to, uh, well, wherever you get your podcasts. We're, <laughs> we're really on all podcast players and apps. And just uh, search Google, search your podcast player, search YouTube for Ageless Wisdom Mystery School. It's, uh, it's harder to find, actually, if you search Wisdom of the Soul. So search Ageless Wisdom Mystery School. And if you subscribe, especially a YouTube subscription would help us a lot. We're stretching for 500. We're at about 450. And YouTube will begin to support us, uh, push us out, recommend us to others um, when, we, when we get to that 500 mark. So we're almost there. We got uh, 15 new subscribers last month. Today we're going to talk about the unquenchable desire nature. In fact, I had titled the program uh, Unquenchable Desire, and then I decided to call it instead the subtle gnawing of discontent. I guess we're going to talk about happiness, satisfaction, contentment, and why enough is never enough. There are, uh, particularly in Buddhist philosophy, a list of what are often referred to as sufferings. And there's six or seven, depending on how you count them, ways that ways that we suffer, and if suffering is uh, too strong a word, then discontent might be a better way to say it. But there is the, uh, the classic sickness, aging, and death. You read this in the story of Siddhartha as a young prince when he finally gets off the, <laughs> gets off the reservation and goes into town one day and he encounters sickness, aging, and death, and has never seen such a thing. And this put him on his quest to uh, end suffering. And he figured out pretty quickly that having a lot of money is he was a prince, right? He was going to inherit his whole kingdom. He found out that didn't make him happy, and... Uh, he left home, left a wife and a child, snuck out. He, he was afraid that if you want to say goodbye, that uh, you wouldn't be able to leave. So uh, <laughs> whatever you think of that, uh, he skipped town. He split, didn't even say goodbye, and became a, uh, a pauper and suffered extreme uh, the extremes of uh, deliberate poverty, uh, eating very little, and uh, sleeping on a bed of nails when possible, and standing on one foot for hours in an attempt to, it sounds like he was trying to generate suffering, but the whole idea was if I could move to the opposite of wealth and prosperity and power, Maybe I could escape suffering through extreme deprivation. And that didn't work for him. So having a lot of money didn't make him happy, at least not for long, and uh, material stuff and power. And then having nothing, well, that didn't work. And so at some point in his early 30s, he sits under this Bodhi tree and he says, I'm not moving until I figure this out, and he discovers the middle way. So, the, the, the original story of the sickness, aging, and death comes from that story of Prince Siddhartha. Gautama Siddhartha was his name. There's also injury, 
So that's four. And um, then there is the suffering or discontent of not getting what you want, the suffering of losing what you have. And then the seventh is, it's six if you add injury and illness together. <laughs> so six or seven, the last one is the suffering of realizing that your desire nature is never satiated, that you're never going to be satisfied. And oddly, most people grow old and die and never have that recognition. It never occurs to them, not once, that I'm on a treadmill, a hamster wheel of looking for happiness, some sort of sustained fulfillment or contentment. And so I acquire this object, I attain this status, this job, this condition or circumstance, this event, this relationship, whatever. And voila, I'm happy for a short period of time. And the reason I call this episode today the subtle gnawing of discontent is that it is really subtle the way desire as soon as you're happy as soon as you get what you want this one big thing whatever it is doesn't take very long before that desire nature starts looking around for something else um I remember as a kid, I don't think I noticed it, certainly did not understand it the way I do now, but all that stuff that I had to have at Christmas, I just would die for, you know, mommy, please, please, I've got to have this or that or whatever. And I got it and I was thrilled and Christmas was magical. And the family was there and everybody was happy and singing songs and a big family dinner. And then there's a crash. There's this letdown. It may be an easy, gradual letdown. Maybe it's just all the sugar. I don't, I don't know, but you crash and suddenly all those things that you piled up having opened them on Christmas morning, just they didn't have the attraction that they seem to have. And that could be, you know, a car or a house or a job or a relationship. You know, that relationship, that that partner that you've just, you just have to have this relationship, right? And for 30 days, 60 days, maybe even 90 days, things are smooth as silk. You're on cloud nine, couldn't be happier. And then something happens. What is that? What is that discontent? What is that wandering around? What are we looking for? And do we even know what we want? I mean, what we really want. I understand that each of us thinks we know on certain occasions what we want. But if you consider the story, for example, of the genie in the bottle and you rub the, the lamp and the genie comes out and grants you three wishes, you're still stuck because you have to know what you want. I've yet to read a story where the first wish is, tell me what I want, because <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it, the, has it occurred to us from time to time that the reason we don't have what we want is because we don't know what we want? Not really, not specifically, not in any detail. And all the times that we're spoiled by getting what we thought we wanted and then finding out it ain't all that. Well, this is a trap and we can avoid this suffering by developing contentment exactly as you are. 
In Eastern philosophy, this principle is generally called acceptance, but it's misunderstood in the West. Acceptance is not the end of things, like, oh, you just got to accept it. Never going to happen. It's not going to make you happy. Um, it's pie in the sky. Nice dream. You're fooling yourself, you know. No, I don't mean that kind of acceptance. Acceptance is not the end of things. Acceptance is the beginning of things. I would suggest to you today that acceptance means to acknowledge reality in the current moment. And that's where you begin. If you want to modify or improve or change, you still have to first accept it and then change. But can we do that? Can we improve our lives? Is all desire bad? Or is it just a matter of getting hip to the fact that it's not going to be ultimately fulfilling? Some of what I want to talk about today. Hope you're on board with this and uh, maybe we'll contribute some comments or questions at the end of the class today. I think this is fascinating. Because I have desires, I have lots of desires, but I approach them differently than, <laughs> than I did as a young man. So I'd love to discuss some of that with you later. Let's do our opening meditation. If you get comfortable in your chairs or your pillow or whatever furniture you're sitting on and you want to scooch back and sit up straight. You can use the back of the furniture to support you and think in terms of being oh, well balanced and centered, not rigid, certainly, because we want to relax the body. So as you sit up straight, shoulders back, balance your head, little forward, little back, a little left and right, get a sense of your head being balanced on your neck and shoulders, directly above the hips, feet flat on the floor, unless you're sitting cross-legged, and just begin to settle in, form the intention to create and sense a feeling of relaxation throughout your body, a letting go feeling. As if for the next few minutes, minutes uh, there's no place to go, nothing to do. And it should be a little surprising how deeply you can relax, how much holding on, how much routine holding on we're able to release just by turning our attention to it. But then we can go deeper and become even more relaxed. So scan your body with your awareness. Sweeping slowly from one end to the other. Checking out various muscle groups. Areas where you know you're prone to gathering tension. Maybe the upper legs or the, or the hips. Maybe neck and shoulders. It's a popular area to carry, to carry undue tension. And just feel the softening in your body as if you're very safe. If you like to sunbathe on a warm day, not too hot, but when the warmth of the sun caresses you, and you feel a, almost a melting feeling, like butter softening on a warm day. Feel that feeling from head to toe. There's a certain vulnerability that goes with relaxing deeply. 
So remind yourself that that's the right feeling because you're safe, your eyes are closed, your breathing is slow and natural, your muscles are loose and limp. These are all messages to the brain that you're really quite safe and can relax even more. And one of the changes that happens is brain waves begin to slow down as if you're moving in the direction of sleep. But we're going to float right between deep sleep and wide awake. There's a center to that, a very natural, kind of a daydreaming place. It has a warmth, an ease, even an elegance about it. When you keep letting go, and letting go, letting go not only of physical tension, but letting go of emotional distress, sadness and despair, worry and doubt. Just let it go. You're safe. You can worry about it later if you insist on it, but right now, see what happens if you just drop it. Letting go also means releasing the mental frenzy. Just because an idea pops in your head doesn't mean you have to chase it down. Just decide not to go after it. And it will pass. And another idea will fill the void, but don't get on the thought train, just stay on the bench in the station, let that train pull out of the station without you, you need not get on board. But we relax in all of those ways, physically and letting go emotionally and mentally as well. And then take three or four nice, slow, deep, deliberate breaths, inhaling through the nose when you're ready. Nice, big, deep inhalation. And as you peak, hold for just a beat. And then exhale every bit as slowly through the nose or the mouth and feel yourself going deeper and becoming even more relaxed. And do that a second, third, or fourth time, pulling in strength and power when you inhale, and feel the letting go, the safety and the peace, the quiet as you exhale. Couple more times, feeling safer, settling down, going deeper, becoming more and more relaxed. And then breathe normally. Turn your breathing over to autopilot and move your awareness to the bottom of your nose and watch your body breathing itself all by itself. Consider this a practice of non-attachment.
where you identify as the one who observes the body breathing itself and acknowledging that you need not cooperate. In fact, you need not monitor. You're just curiously observing. Curious or even fascinated that your body breathes itself all by itself and doesn't really need you to manage anything. And you just watch. And consider thoughts a diversion. Recognize that Random ideas will petition you for your attention. Listen to me. Look at me. Pay attention to me. What about this? What about that? When are you going to get this done? What about all these problems? Don't resist that, but don't encourage it. Know that these are intrusive, random thoughts begging for your attention. But right now, for the next few minutes, you've devoted yourself to instead watching the body with great fascination and intrigue breathe itself. How cool. It may feel a little awkward at times to admit that you really don't have to participate. You don't have to double check and make sure your body is breathing. Body does not need your attention. in order to breathe or for your heart to beat or food to be digested or a thousand and one other autonomic reactions that happen continuously below the threshold of your awareness. Acknowledge that. How cool that you are free simply to be the watcher. Such peace, such grace. such a wonder. And just for a moment, I'd like you to consider how much of our waking life we overmanage. that our free-floating and non-specific anxiety suggests we have a major responsibility to micromanage everything. Recognize how exhausting it becomes to always be on guard for fear of making a mistake, 
falling short. Disappointing others. And then what would they think of you? Worry, worry. Gosh, and we try so hard, don't we? Like little kids trying to win the approval of our parents. I mean, look at me, look what I can do. Wouldn't you like to give that up? Consider that in a universe that refuses to even replicate snowflakes, you are unique, one of a kind, never has been, never will be another you. You're perfect at being you without trying. Can you allow yourself to consider that as a possibility that would, without any effort whatsoever, without any fear of making a mistake or doing poorly or screwing it up big time. You can let go and be you. Without fail. Without any concern whatsoever. And of course, we are evolving creatures, like all things. We learn, we grow, which means we make mistakes. A lot of this is trial and error. Give yourself permission to screw it up. Just stop calling it failure. The only failure is giving up. You can't climb a ladder without letting go. You can't move forward without leaving where you've been. Instead of being your own worst critic, consider how it would feel to be the president of your fan club the master of your ship, the, the captain of your, of your destiny. A cheerleader for your own growth. An unfoldment. Not just random evolution but an unfolding of a potential yet undiscovered that wants to come forward. And so life touches you with a feather and whispers in your ear, but you missed it because the fear was shouting and you were busy micromanaging things that work best when they're left alone. And so life has an agenda for you. And because you missed the feather's touch, it gives you a little shove. You know how that feels. 
and it gets your attention, but you quickly restore your balance and busy yourself chasing down those thoughts, worrying and wondering, am I good enough? Can I do it? Will I make it? And what will others think? So, failing to get our attention with the feathers touch and the gentle shove, life finds a sharp pointy stick and pokes you. Get your attention again. This time, ow, that hurt. What the hell? What's going on here? That's not fair. And you don't even realize it. Some aspect of your life is trying to get your attention. Pay attention, take a look. An unexamined life is not worth living. If you don't discern, discover, and develop you, <laughs> who, who's going to do that? And then you're wasted? We lose you? We need you. Wake up. So we ignore the feathers touch, the gentle shove, the pointed stick, and so life finds a brick and hits you over the head with it. You call it a tragedy, a disaster, whatever it is. You lose your job, you lose your house, you go bankrupt, your partner kicks you to the curb. Your kids rebel, your friends die. The dog doesn't even like you anymore. When you have love in your heart, when you devote yourself to understanding yourself, that you might then see yourself in all things and recognize separation as an illusion and your part in the one life and the one thing. When you devote yourself to that, all things work together for good. Everything is your teacher. And the problem is not your problem or those problems. The problem is our resistance to it. And the problem is not the heartache and the loneliness and the despair, but our resistance to it. Acceptance is where we where we begin. Recommit yourself to yourself. I know you're lovely people, especially especially someone interested in the study of consciousness who wishes to be more aware. And you're kind and compassionate. You're caregivers you want to do for others and be of service to others. But we have to put ourselves first and develop the instrument. You got to tune the instrument. Not a selfish thing, 
to love yourself unless you misunderstand the self and think it's separate. Then we become selfish and self-centered. Selfish people put themselves first and behave in selfish ways. But the most loving and kind, the most charitable and philanthropic, the most generous, tolerant, patient people must put themselves first to know themselves so as to be more empathetic and compassionate. And sometimes that's just not comfortable. We're not used to that. Codependence can be a distraction. and avoidance behavior. Consider introspection and contemplation using meditation to dis discover yourself and develop what you discover. Consider that the greatest, most grand adventure of all. How exciting. It would be great to travel, wouldn't it? To see Europe or Asia or the Middle East, Africa, the South Pole, <laughs> or to go into space to orbit the Earth, to visit the moon, to go to Mars, the bottom of the ocean, perhaps. But none of those adventures could outshine the joy and the thrill of an inner exploration of who you are, what you're for, <laughs> and why you give a damn? Why you care? Why do you care? Who is this? What is this part of you that cares? You're not what you think of yourself. We know we're not what others think of us. To hell with that. We have little influence over others. But I would argue further that we're not what we think of ourselves so much as we are what we care about. Explore your heart. What do you love and why? What's important to you? What are your priorities? Bring this sense of curiosity, of intrigue, of adventure and excitement with you as we return to the waking state. In three simple steps, first, just form the intention. Secondly, feel a direction, a kind of a floating upward toward the waking state drifting, like awakening slowly in the morning. And three is eyes open, wide awake. Do that now. Open your eyes. Alert, rested, refreshed, feeling better and better and better. Feeling better than before. Eyes open, wide awake, back in the room. And maybe a nice deep breath and a little stretch. <sighs> And thank you for that. So discontent can really be a good thing. This subtle gnawing 
And sometimes not so subtle. Sometimes it can be really urgent. But it's so confusing. It's like, well, again, what do I want? What would make me happy? I don't know. A lot of us spend too much time looking at others and what appears to make them happy. But all you see is the surface. So you may see the happiness of success in another person's life, but you don't see the way that deteriorates until it happens to you. And you get a, well, something new, a new car. And you promise yourself you're going to wash it every Saturday and wax it once a month and never let anybody smoke in your car. I was going to say something about ashtrays, but cars don't, <laughs> cars don't have ashtrays anymore. Um, you know, and hardly a month goes by before some moron pushes a shopping cart into the side of your car. You paid thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 for it. Now it's not perfect anymore. And you're crushed. Right? <laughs> What's that line? We've all heard our mothers at one point say, and that's why we can't have nice things. <laughs> you rotten kids. No respect. That's why we can't have nice things. You can't have nice things because we live in a world where all things are impermanent. All material things are rotting before your very eyes. They're all in decay. Nothing lasts. It's a it's it's an illusion created by advertisers and manufacturers and big multinational corporations that you can own something. Even a home that that you're told you own your home. Yeah, I'll miss three payments and see what happens. See who owns your home. Even if you 90% of the way toward paying it off. You don't own squat. And the car or anything else that we think we own, musical instruments, which I love dearly, my guitars. And they're all in decay. They're all rotting. You can't, you can't really possess something. It's an illusion. It's only for a short period of time. So doesn't it make sense if the object you desire or the circumstance or condition is not static, but in perpetual decay, that the satisfaction that you get from possessing it would also be in perpetual decay? that the feeling that comes from oh boy far out is going to fade and every thought you've ever had faded I was talking to Doreen this morning we're both writing books about motivation writer's block it's got lots of names and i was i was sharing with her uh my own sense of the ebb and flow of being motivated to write and sometimes i just burn to do it and i just jump into it and you know it consumes me and i just write and write and research and i've got three documents open, you know, my scratch pad. And then I have a, a grammar program that I put it in and check grammar and, and um, 
you know, punctuation and that kind of thing. And then uh, finally a Word document, and I'm balancing all of this and got Google open on the side and doing research. And then other times, voice in my head says, you should write today. You've got a couple hours here. And I have to admit, I just I don't feel like it. I'm just not motivated. And then the mind rushes in with a bunch of reasons, but the reasons aren't real. They're just trying to fill in the blank. The point is, you're not motivated emotionally. That's what matters, not the mental justification or explanation. That's silly. That doesn't matter. The point is, you, you've lost the passion. You've lost the fire. Well, of course, everything is impermanent. Everything fades. But here's the thing. It comes back around again, doesn't it? We've talked in the last few weeks about the ebb and flow of all things, the yin and the yang, the the crest and the trough of the wave. Everything is energy. Everything vibrates. Everything has its coming and going. So why struggle? Just wait for it to come around again. Go. I don't feel like writing. Fine. Oh, go do something else. Sure got a lot to do. Or maybe I remind myself that I need to spend more time meditating or contemplating or just sitting outdoors in the evening watching the sun go down. Allowing Venus <laughs> to entertain me for an hour or two as, it, as she gets brighter and brighter and lower and lower in the evening sky. I consider that productive. <laughs> and then the fires will come back and I'll wake up one day and go, damn, what a great idea. I got to put that in the book. And all of a sudden, I mean, wait for it. Don't, don't push the river. Don't force yourself. I think we can avoid a lot of discontent when we put ourselves in tune with the rhythms of our lives, the rhythms of things, and know that whatever situation you're in, highly motivated or completely unmotivated, it'll change. <laughs> it'll, it'll cycle around. Just wait for it. Like the surfer. Maybe the ocean's flat, but you paddle out anyway. And you just hang out on the board and Suddenly, a few waves start to rise up all by themselves. Here they come. Then there's a story of the seventh wave, so you count. And sure enough, the seventh wave is the big one. And you catch it and ride. Then you paddle out, and then you wait. The patience is the hard part, I guess. Now, here's another point when we talk about the subtle gnawing of discontent and how we set ourselves up for discontent, why we don't recognize this hamster wheel or this, this treadmill of, uh, I want it, I really want it, I've got to have it, I'll die if I don't get it, and then voila, success, victory, accomplishment, and I'm happy as a lark for an hour, a day, a month, a year, but it doesn't last and is quickly replaced by another desire. Let's get hip to that trick. Let's, let's, let's get smart about it. Okay. Doesn't mean you can't allow yourself to have desire. I mean, <laughs> if you desired to have no desire, would that not be a desire? So that's a little conundrum. Desire in and of itself is not a problem. If, if you're new to Buddhist philosophy, you might look at 
the second noble truth and say, well, desire is the problem. I suffer because I want things to be other than they are. It's pretty straightforward, these four noble truths. Number one, life is suffering. You will know suffering. Number two, it's the result of your desire nature. You set yourself up for it. If you were content with what you have and admit that that's quite good enough, you wouldn't have the desire and you wouldn't be disappointed and you wouldn't suffer. Noble truth number three, there's a way out. You can stop doing this. And number four is how. The Noble Eightfold Path, which we discussed in these classes a few months ago. Check that out if you missed it, the Noble Eightfold Path. It's adjacent to a class we did on the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. Also eight in number. Eight Beatitudes, eight steps on the Noble Path. The fourth truth is the Eightfold Path. How to get out of it. It begins with right view and right livelihood. I'll not going to review that now. But this desire nature is a trap. And I think it's compounded by a misunderstanding of any kind of success as a destination, particularly love and happiness since that's ultimately what everybody wants. It's the one thing everybody could agree on. Well, I just, yeah, I want this and this and this. I want this material thing and, and I want this quality of relationships in my life. And I want these conditions and circumstances and this event and that event, whatever. So that we can be happy. I mean, that's bottom line. What you want is to be happy or content, or satisfied, or satiated, or fulfilled, or joyous, happy for no reason. But here's the deal. We think of happiness like success as a destination. And so we behave in ways that we believe will take us to happiness, that we have to create happiness. You know, like school or work. You have to school, you have to study, you get a good grade. Everybody's happy. The teacher's happy, your parents are happy, and that makes you happy or at work, or in your familial relationships, making other people happy, we see as a way of us being happy. And it works. I'm not denying it. I try, try, try real hard in my life to make other people happy, and I enjoy happiness as a consequence. But that's not that's not the whole story. What about being happy as a way of creating success instead of thinking only of success as making you happy? There was a newspaper man in the 1960s, I'm trying to remember his name, Musty, I think. He had initials, it was like A.J. Musty or something like that. But what I do remember is the quotable quote that he wrote. This was in the Vietnam War era, and he said, there is no way to peace. Peace is the way. And I was in college when we heard that, and it just blew my lid. Holy cow major reframe. <laughs> War doesn't make peace. You don't get 
to peace through war, or what did Nixon call it? Peace through strength. Boy, there's an evil euphemism for you. You have to get through peace by killing people and blowing stuff up. That's the way you get to peace. It's insane on the surface of it. But that's what we do with a military budget that we dare to call a defense budget. By the way, nobody's probably ever told you this, but less than 15% of so-called defense spending goes to defend the country. 85% and more goes to project your power and influence in foreign places. America has combat troops, armed combat troops in 150 nations. There's only 195 nations in the world. Not nearly that many in the UN, but 195 nations in the world, you're paying to have armed military, American military troops in 150 of them, and we call it defense. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way. This is true also for love. There is no way to love. There is no way to happiness. Love and happiness is the way. Well, I think that merits being written down if you got a pencil or a pen. That is such a wonderful way to reorient yourself on a daily basis. Your personal peace and love and happiness is not a destination. And how much of what we do is an attempt, the problems we solve, the heartache we deal with, the relationships we cultivate and grieve when they're lost, is to try to create happiness. You don't have to create happiness. Happiness is a choice. You choose now to be happy, content, fulfilled for no reason, and recognize desire as a liar. Desire is saying you're not happy. What is the essence of advertising <laughs> and marketing? but to convince you that you're not happy. Oh, you may think you're happy, but you're not because you don't have the new and improved, the better feature rich version of <laughs> I remember seeing a Saturday Night Live skit years and years ago back in the early days, like probably the late 70s, early 80s. I think it was Dan Aykroyd actually came out as a, uh, you know, a TV huckster. And uh, he was going to sell the latest and the greatest model uh, a device for cleaning your home. And it used no power and never broke down and uh, was more efficient than any other device. And he breaks it out and it's a broom. <laughs> and he goes about this three or four minute routine that was just brilliant of demonstrating this wonderful new invention, simple, elegant, energy efficient, never broke, never breaks down the broom. They must have fallen off their chairs at Dyson in Hoover and Bissell when they saw that. 
Look, I like new stuff as much as anybody. I love gadgets. I mentioned the musical instruments, which to me are almost like living things. I like computers. I like that we can do these Zoom classes and uh, cool technology. I even like AI, although it scares me. And it should, because even the guys that own the corporations, the AI, like open AI and Google and, and, and Apple and Microsoft, they're scared to death. They were in front of Congress last week begging for regulation. And they said it's it's an existential threat. AI is an existential threat. These are the people that own the AI corporations saying these robots could cause the extinction of humanity on the level of global warming or nuclear war. And yet we can't put it down because it also holds such extraordinary promise. You can't just, what's the story? You can't get rid of all the spinning wheels in the kingdom to make sure the princess doesn't prick her finger on the, on the needle. Somebody's going to have a spinning wheel hidden away someplace or the, the, the Jurassic Park thing, you know, of, uh, oh, we have only, uh, what was it? Only, only male dinosaurs or only female dinosaurs, so they'll never breed. No, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> Nature finds a way. So I love all this stuff. I think the secret is to be hip to the trick. If you're going to desire something, even just let's keep it simple, just an object, an item. Gosh, I would really like to have this cool thing. But uh, maybe something new that I've never had. Maybe something to replace a device that I have that needs replacing, or I really like all the new cool features. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with desire in and of itself, as long as you know that the satisfaction that you get from obtaining it or possessing it will decay. And the subtle gnawing of discontent is going to rise up on its own and lead you in another direction that is unending, as long as you're hip to the trick. When you desire something and really, really want it, hold it gently in the palm of your hand as if it's fragile. because you may not get it, or if and when you do, you may have to settle, or you may get everything you wanted and find out it ain't all that, you were duped. You only thought it would make you happy and it didn't. And however happy it does make you, that fades. I'm just arguing that there is an overriding, overshadowing happiness, fulfillment, contentment that doesn't rely on the acquisition of material stuff or states, conditions, or relationships. To just be who you are, to sit quietly, and marvel at the fact that your body breathes itself. To contemplate a sunset, flowers in a meadow, a single flower. To look at the beauty that surrounds you and so often we ignore because we're too busy.
to linger with that appreciation of the newness and the freshness of each moment as it dawns upon you, the eternal now, now, and the rhythm. I mean, time may be an illusion, but rhythm is real. There is there is an in-breath and an out-breath, a yin and a yang, a, a coming and going in the now, a waxing and a waning right now. Don't be confused. Now is not a static thing by any means. It's full and it's rich and it's beautiful and it's wonderful and it's happiness for no reason. It's joy. And it's right here, right now. And it's always available without condition. It's not a destination. We're being lied to by advertisers, politicians, movers, shakers, opinion makers, and, <laughs> and by our own desire nature that says, no, cowboy, you only think you're happy. The, the, the fulfillment we're looking for is an understanding of self and your relationship to all that is. That happiness, that joy is infinite and eternal and is the only thing that will not fade or suffer impermanence, will not decay. And then no more suffering. It's a practice. It's not just a decision you make on this Sunday morning and go, oh, far out. Well, I'll just give up my desire nature and be happy now for no reason. No, it's a, pro <laughs> it's a process, I assure you. And I would love to hear from you right now. Let's open up the, I was going to say open up the telephones, but those are the old days. Let's uh, turn to our co-host today, Melinda. And if you just want to send her a, a, a chat directed to Melinda and say, I've got a question or a comment about this or that, keep it brief, and then she can uh, call on you and uh, we'll expand. On, I'll either answer the, the question or respond to the comment or uh, we can open up the conversation and go a little deeper. We got, we got a good 20 minutes here. So thank you for your attention. Melinda, how are we doing? Oh, uh, we've got a comment. Uh, it's from Kasha, and I think they want to uh, speak directly to you. I just would like to preface the Q&A with, thank you for everything you said today. I feel like you're in my living room speaking to me, and I wonder if other people feel that way. I know you... You do the meditation and then the talk comes, you talked about how it comes through you. It's not rehearsed. And I think there's something to you connecting with us that um, I just really felt it today. So thank you. Oh, thanks. Uh, I appreciate that acknowledgement. Um, it's why I like the idea of doing a live Zoom class. Whether there's five people here or 50 people doesn't matter to me. Uh, the, the fact that it's live, like the old radio shows I used to do, um, that carries over into the recording on YouTube and uh, the podcast as well. And it, if I do it solo, then it's just me, but there's a group energy here. There's a group consciousness that, yeah, I mean, how much of what I'm saying is coming from you guys telepathically. There's a group mind and the opening meditation sets that up in many ways. So I think it's so cool that you picked up on that. Anish said you're in my living. He said you're in his living room as well. <laughs> well, good. And when well, you're ready, we'll go to Kasha. I'm ready. Hello, Michael. Hello, Hello, everyone. Hi, Melinda. Hi, um, Hi, Michael. Um, you know, um, you uh, you try to encourage us to uh, to come up with comments and ask questions. I teach courses in sociology, and I do the same with my students. I try to encourage them to uh, participate. 
uh, and during your, you know, your your Sunday talk, um, I want to um, contribute, and I have, you know, number of questions. But I ask myself, why is it that I am holding myself? Uh, is it because I'm uh, I'm scattered? Is it because I'm worried about you know saying something you know uh, stupid or you know I mean um, so this is this is sort of a self reflection that I do um, uh, you know during many of the sessions that you have. Um, but I wanted to jump in first uh, to uh, share just a couple of things, maybe overcome that um, um, uh, that uh, maybe um, stage fright, if you will. Um, you know, um, this the discussion about desire. We have we have arrived at this conclusion that it is not possible. To not desire, uh, because even if we desire not to desire, that's still, you know, it's desiring in some ways. Right. Um, so, I think, and this has been my own um, experience and conclusion, it is not desire per se. It's the degree of our attachment to those desires. It's just how um, how seriously and, and you know and how apt. Absolutely, we tie our happiness to that desire. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is, um, some, some there was a there was a discussion many years ago uh, with a friend of mine, and, and she was saying that uh, don't you want to have everything that you want because then that would make you happy. And um, it um, it took me back to this idea of the Sufis and. Um, and also of the medieval troubadours who emphasized on this attitude of not um, attaining, but longing. So there are certain desires, and I don't know if those will fall under the category of desires. There are certain things that I would like to attain because I think they will um, deepen the quality of my life with, you know, with my friends, with my relationship to the na nature, society, uh, and um, I should be content as I have arrived at this, uh, you know, attitude by always having a number of desires that will never be fulfilled. Um, in uh, the old movie uh, Love Story uh, came out in, in the 70s. Uh, uh, you know, Ryan O'Neill and Ellie McGraw, you know, they fell in love. And uh, as Ellie McGraw was dying of cancer, um, uh, Ryan O'Neill was saying that, you know, Ellie McGraw could name all the 620 something um, pieces of Mozart that listed in the Kershaw list, or she. Um, she could name all those 620 pieces. Wasn't that great? Uh, and I, as a fan of Mozart, thought I'm not that crazy about learning all the 620 pieces because I would like always to have some unfinished things as my life goes on to strive to learn more. It's I don't I don't tie you know my um, you know, my contentment, not so much happiness, my contentment, my fulfillment to, you know, attaining everything that I want. Certain things should be ongoing and never be fulfilled. You know, it's, it's, it's a balance between, you know, what is fulfilled, and by that I'm not talking necessarily about material goods, um, about experiences, basically. Uh, you know, in, in my case, most of my um, most of my life experience uh, happens through things that are ephemeral um, experiences, music, concerts, operas, nature. Um, my belongings are only some books and, you know, and, and music. So uh, as far as the desire, you know, I, um, I think, um, I mean, we, um, we are bombarded by, as you mentioned, advertisements and, and our 
uh, consumer culture that we should attain or uh, 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 or obtain certain things, and they they will you know make us happy. Like you said, I like my uh, iPhone as much as the next guy. You know, it's just an amazing piece of um, technology. But it's just you know it's the degree that I take. Um, um, Take that seriously. It's it's the degree of attachment to it. Uh, and nowadays, of course, the um, um, the important thing becomes to detach from, you know, all these gadgets that are so fascinating and have become, you know, everyday part of our, our lives. Every day that I wake up, first thing that I do is turn my iPhone on. You know, I get connected, and uh, I I think, well, maybe next day I should practice not to do that. Maybe. Uh, should go on a uh, uh, you know on a you know uh, diet or technology diet. <laughs> yeah. So uh, just to stop you know and not uh, going uh, um, my um, so it's it's actually a you know it's a balance between uh, ha having or uh, or getting what we want and not getting you know not getting what we desire and that's one thing and also the degree that we're attached to the desires. Um, you know whether it is owning us or we are owning it in that in that manner. So well, that's a comment. I don't know what you read into it. Well, what stands out from the four or five wonderful points that I heard you make is that the longing or the urging may be enough that um, perhaps the reason the desire, you know, there is a brain chemistry aspect to this also, I'd like to touch on briefly in a minute. But do I hear you saying that you feel as if we were somehow able to quench the desire nature to attain, if attainment or success was ultimately fulfilling, then we would reach some level beyond which we would never grow or or continue to evolve toward a more godlike i think that's what we are as animals aspiring to god a human sort of in the middle we have an animal body and a spiritual nature and so isn't that ultimate desire to be fulfilled in that way, to know the peace again and, and the, uh, the, the happiness that we imagine divinity to represent and, and hasten to add the, the virtues, the ethics and the values that go along with that. I've always been, well, not always, <laughs> many, many years intrigued by the idea that evolution of consciousness, evolution of awareness, expanded awareness, higher consciousness brings with it exalted virtues and values like kindness or, you know, sympathy or empathy or um, willingness to sacrifice. Uh, to care about others and their welfare. They just seem to go hand in hand. And it's, it's almost as if the uh, consciousness itself, whatever that is, awareness is the best synonym, understanding maybe, uh, insight, as if values and, and, and uh, ethics, morality, virtue is embedded in that consciousness. So the more conscious we are, the more virtuous we become. And so we have to continually have that longing and that urging. And you're saying the Sufis, for example, if I understand you, Kasha, find that to be enough. It's not love fulfilling, it's love drawing you closer to the object of your love, the, the, the ultimate supreme creator. Is that? That's, is that... that's part of it. 
Michael, yeah. Um, but um, I mean, the idea is that exactly the longing and not attaining will take you inside, you know, and through a journey inside yourself as part of, you know, the great unity, then yeah. you will arrive at the, you know, at the one truth. Um, but, you know, in, in our life um, style, um, I mean, this saying is attributed to Christ that you know, man is not alive by bread alone. You Have you heard that? Yes, um, of course. Or, and then the question becomes, okay, what is it then beyond bread that, uh, that you know, man or human, you know, need uh, in, in order to, you know, sustain life? Um, so that's, Part of it, I think, is desiring, um, but it's just then the nature of desiring and the degree of, again, uh, repeating myself, uh, uh, the attachment to that desire. Um, it's, um, I mean, we can bring different categories into it, whether it's material or whether it's, uh, you know, um, uh, the love for, for the neighbor or, 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 you know, the feeling of unity amongst all things that we, we feel. But uh, um, it's again, you know, it's it's not an issue of you know giving up desire. It's just um, how you you know how you treat it, how you relate to it. Right. Uh, desire, you know, uh, you know, determine your whole direction. Is, is your happiness c contingent upon you know attaining that desire? Um, so. But then also there's the other important distinction that you, you brought up, that it's not, you know, attainment that brings happiness. It's, it's happiness is a choice that, you know, we separate from, from the conditional, you know, uh, situation that if, if, we, if we meet the right person, if we, you know, if we um, land the right job, then we will be happy. And then, you know, the idea of ha what is happiness and what is joy those two things you know, manifestations of you know more momentary you know feelings versus an attitude that we carry you, you you remind me also of the saying that it's uh, the journey not the destination you know it's the it's the road trip that's fun it doesn't really matter where you go or <laughs> where you end up it's just the road trip Kasha, I want to see if others have a comment or a question, but thank Thanks, you, brother. Michael. Thanks, Thanks for your patience. Uh, anybody nobody's else? Come, nobody's come forward, but I bet anybody can just chime in. Just don't even go through me. Just speak right up one at a time, and we want to hear what you have to say. Melinda, do you want to do a couple of minutes on uh, the dopamine brain chemistry side of this? Uh, the little hits that we get when we make progress toward a goal or when we think we attain it. And then that chemical is, you know, what's the word reuptake? It, <laughs> it doesn't mm -hmm. last. So we well, reuptake, it... Yeah. Reuptake of course is when it goes back in and recycles. That's how Anna depressants work with serotonin basically but sure i can do that is there anything anything else you want to add no just that there's a brain chemistry aspect to impermanence and the treadmill of always wanting more and different and new and yeah uh, exactly you know yeah. even even shopping you know the rush i get from an amazon package at the door mm -hmm. it, it's a i it helps me to see that everything is regulated through that reward pathway. It's very powerful. And whether it's spinning the roulette wheel um, and either winning or losing, it, what happens is we get these signals from our brain and we release a myriad of neurochemicals that, that um, activate pleasure centers or pain centers. Dopamine, serotonin are two of the biggies. And so, I've looked at my life and realized it's a series of uh, things that I want to up my dopamine, whether it's going out and buying plants at the store and planting them or um, 
look, looking forward to something. I, they're, they're, that's the mediator that is common to pretty much everything that we feel. And um, they've come to understand this through addiction studies. They, they've actually done little mice brain studies where they put little teeny, this sounds awful, little teeny pipettes in mice brains and then they're able to, uh, to have them lever pressed to cocaine and, and various substances and then they can actually measure their neurotransmitters. I mean, th this technology was not available, uh, of course, years ago, but and it's progressing all the time. But it's, it's interesting to me that what feels like an emotion really has a chemical base in my brain. And if I can say to myself, uh, the common denominator is, is wanting to get that, that relaxation pleasure hit because it, it's a big hit. And uh, it's like, ah, there oh, it's, I am. It's morphine-like, is it not? That's, it is. That's exactly right. This is where I need to be. So I just do the behavior but, but like you're saying, I, I, I like to remember Pavlov's experiment where after a while, he didn't need the meat. All he needed was the bell that the dog associated with the meat and the, dog, the dog's brain said, oh, here comes the meat. So I, I guess I've come to try to realize that if I want to stop a certain behavior, too much of anything in my, too much gardening flares my backup, for instance. So I try to back up and get that dopamine hit without all the bending and taking that if that helps at all i see it in my own behavior in a number of ways uh one of the most confounding for me is uh eating where i find myself in front of the refrigerator with the door open and i'm not hungry at all right in fact i might be quite full or satiated, so to speak. So then I asked myself, what am I doing here? And there's a whole school of thought that talks about feeding the hungry heart, that what you're looking for is an emotional, you know, comfort food and emotional fix. But beyond that is this brain chemistry. It's the dopamine hit of knowing that you do have food when I, <laughs> my understanding of that is we've all had past lives where we've starved to death. Hmm. And uh, I don't think we realize that nature, the vast majority of creatures on this planet, live their entire lives on the edge of starvation. That's right. And, it, you know, food is even trickier, Michael, than certain things, although there may be receptors in other target organs that we don't we don't we don't realize but they've done a lot of study on the serotonin release in the gut so not only is it in the brain but the gut is loaded with serotonin receptors and and i i, I used to compulsively overeat and i got i would get this feeling of relaxation it didn't last yeah it was this is where i want to be and i didn't under this was 30 40 50 years ago i didn't understand i was just manipulating my neuroendocrine system well, we evolved from the gut forward where worms and snakes and uh, lizards and uh, fish, I mean, were basically guts that grew out and got heads and appendages. But um, it makes sense that there would be neurons in the belly. And, and uh, uh, again, this is outside my purview, but I understand that these neurons communicate with the brain and spine through the vagus nerve. And they're... the other problem I wanted to point out, which I think is really key, is we have upregulation and downregulation of these receptors for, for these uh, tasks. And let, let's, let's take drugs or alcohol as an example. The more we drink, the more we upregulate those receptors to handle the, the constant stimulus. You know, we get kind of uh, numbed to any stimulus or it would be overpowering. So the brain brain adjusts, but what happens is when we start to fall off that level of drug or alcohol in our system, those receptors say, ah, uh -uh. this is really common with smoking. I mean, people that smoke an hour without a cigarette is torture. The brain is screaming, come on, come on. But the paradox or the salvation is that if we just don't do the behavior, 
they downregulate again. It's like yeah. an alcoholic doesn't go through their whole life sober saying, gee, I wish I had a drink every five minutes because the brain adjusts and says, okay, you're not drinking brain, find something else. That, that's the great salvation here. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. I think that's interesting to uh, look at it from a brain chemistry point of view as well. And again, the whole idea is to be more aware of what's going on. That puts us at choice. That makes us more conscious, more aware. And then we have more choices. Okay, uh, good class today. I've enjoyed this. I hope you did too. Again, if you will uh, uh, subscribe to the podcast, Ageless Wisdom Mystery School, to the YouTube channel, Ageless Wisdom Mystery School, it really helps us, uh, raises us in keyword searches so others can find it. And uh, a comment and a like is also helpful in that way. Join us next week. See what we're up to every Sunday at 11 California time, Sunday morning at 11 a.m. California time. And to get your newsletter, if you're not receiving every Saturday a newsletter with show notes, uh, go to michaelbenner.com. Also, more information there about my private one-on-one -on -one intensives and the free intro that you can schedule. Thanks for being here today. I'd like you all to unmute and thank each other and say so long and namaste, salam, and aloha. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank, thank you. you, Melinda. Gosh, gosh a great, great conversation today. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.